And now to the new parts of our interview with Gary Neville. Uh, he's been speaking to our senior reporter Melissa Reddy in Qatar about all things Manchester United. They discuss Cristiano Ronaldo's departure, who will replace him, and first, the Glazer family's decision to sell the club. This doesn't surprise me. I've been saying it for six months that the Glazers would have to sell or part sell. Um, anybody that's close enough to the club knows that. Um, there is a need for equity and cash in the club just for the infrastructure investments and, and, and spend that they're going to have to put in for the stadium, the training ground, the sporting project. They haven't got enough money. Yeah. They've got the debt in the club at this moment in time which they can't increase. The debt market's collapsed. And there's also a narrow, very narrow window around the Chelsea valuation that I think was over overhyped. Yeah. Also Liverpool selling. Yes. Super League falling away. The Glazers obviously getting a lot of criticism and persistent protests. There's no doubt the time is now and it's been coming for six, seven months where if you were close enough to the situation in Manchester, you knew that they had to do this um, and there was a narrow window to do it. And I, had to, I thought from the start of the season it had to be within 12 months and here it is. Mm -hmm. It's a big moment now yeah. for the club. And the Glazer family will never get a great exit from Manchester United. But they could have a more pleasant exit, I think, if they do it right. Yeah. And I'd like them to see them over the next couple of months engage properly with the fans about who is going to take over the club. The regulator isn't in place yet, I'd like yes. that to be the case, but I look at the way in which they could do it properly, I look at the fact that they could get two bidders who are sort of near enough the same towards mm -hmm. the end of the towards the end of the process and I think what the Manchester United fans need to see is a manifesto from the new owners they need acceptance we can't I don't think as a club anymore and any club I think in this yeah. position be handed an owner that basically screams against what the club stands for or what the club wants so there are manifesto pledges that I think are really important like a fan voice like the fan experience like maybe even positions for fans on the board but then more practical things the sporting project needs to improve what's the sporting project going to be are they going to not take dividends are they going to make sure it's a debt-free football club Club and that they're reinvesting dividends maybe one day but for the first five years maybe there's a sort of uh, maybe there's a sort of if you like a holiday on on dividends that they put everything back into the club maybe there's a, a obviously a new stadium that needs to be built a new training ground these are pledges that I can think of off the top of my head that are really important I think for anybody bidding for Manchester United it's a manifesto that needs putting forward so that the fans can I think understand because look there's going to be many bids in yeah. the yeah. In, in the many billions I would have suggested mm -hmm. and I think if the if the Glazers want to exit I think in the right way that would be to sell it to a party that isn't only the highest bidder which I'm I'm not naive to think they're not going to sell it to the <laughs> highest bidder but if they can get parties near the end to get to a figure that they like and there might be two or three parties it would be very nice I think for, the, for them to then put something forward to the season ticket holders because the reality of it is if the Glazers want to do this right they have to make sure it's going to a party whereby the fans don't believe they're being lumped with another owner yeah. that they don't like yeah. I've got my nervousness around I've always had my nervousness the reason I didn't sort of well one I was a player at the club and I was an employee um, and also we were successful so when I left the club, obviously, I didn't for the first four, five, six years speak about the Glazer family in a negative fashion. The Super League broke that six, seven years in. That was the end for me in terms of they were willing not only to damage Manchester United and the sporting sort of, if you like, success of the club, they were willing to actually take the rest of English football down with them. Do you regret not saying anything about the leveraged buyout? Did you just not understand it back then? Did you not feel football wasn't a place at that point for players to have it, a voice on those yeah. kind of matters what what was it i'm sure you do regret it um I, I don't want to come up with excuses probably to be fair because we were successful we were managed by sir alex ferguson who you know you, you stuck to football you know the stick to football on twitter with sir alex ferguson you stuck to football there was no player no member of no member of staff ever spoke out against the leverage takeover when it happened we got on with winning trophies and winning champions leagues and winning leagues and the club to be fair carried on being successful and I worked on the theory at the time that we could have worse owners. They were yeah. quite passive, they didn't interfere. Yeah. I never saw any interference whilst I was at the club for that seven or eight years that I was still there. When Sir Alex Ferguson left, it's then that I started to realise that they only were successful because of Sir Alex Sir Alex, Ferguson. Yeah. And actually they've not been able to develop a successful sporting project without him. So the fact of the matter is, they're taking dividends out, they've not developed the stadium, they let the training ground go to ruin. We really are second class when it comes to the sort of status of our sort of infrastructure at the club and our facilities. That can't happen and we're not successful on the pitch. So you put all that together and that's where you get to a point whereby no, enough's enough. And I started to speak out obviously two or three years ago. Many fans will say you should have done it earlier and I cannot disagree with them. Mm. And I can have regrets about it all my life, but the reality 
part of it is I have spoken out in the last two or three years quite a lot. Um, I haven't enjoyed what I've seen. Maybe the, 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 the signs were obviously there 15, 20 years ago and those fans were right. But let's not make sure that we jump out of the frying pan into the fire. Yeah. And we make sure we have a new ownership. I have expressed my concern about state ownership. I've expressed my concern about US investment. But whoever comes in, it's likely to be a US investor. Mm. It's potentially going to be a state-owned project. We need to know what the manifesto is. We need to understand that what they're going to do in that first five to seven years uh, display the intent of building Manchester United up to be what it should aim to be, which is the greatest football club in the world. You mentioned there... Liverpool also being for sale. We're in an unprecedented yeah. situation where two of the greatest sporting institutions in the world, yeah. English football royalty, are on the market at the same time. So it does indicate that this is a peak period for valuations and they're looking at you know the global state of the market and thinking the next few years are probably going to be yeah. quite bleak. How do you see that going? The fact that you know they're fighting it out pretty much in a very small pool of people that can afford yeah. to buy these clubs. But I think we're talking about consortiums, we're talking about potential states that have got trillions of pounds. Um, and you know, I don't want to be disrespectful to Liverpool at all because they're a massive football club. When you look at sort of the height of English football when it mm. comes to viewing figures, fans, commercial revenues, it's Manchester United and Liverpool yeah. at the very top. Forget the fact that Manchester City at this moment in time, I think, create a higher revenue naturally through sort of what would be traditional means. Manchester United and Liverpool are the biggest clubs in the country by a mile. Um, and But Manchester United will be, I think, more sought after and will fetch a higher price than Liverpool yeah. just because of its might. Um, and I think Liverpool probably... Uh, unless they've got something sorted, they're probably going to have to wait a little bit because I think the buyers are probably going to go to Manchester United first, unless there's a Liverpool fan that's very wealthy somewhere who has an allegiance to Liverpool. But I think if you're looking at both as an asset, asset side by side, you choose Manchester United, and that's not just me being biased as a Manchester United fan. So that will likely be the sort of what would be the first bidder on the highest bidder, and then I suspect the rest then will go to Liverpool. Do you think there's any currency in the fact that Liverpool's infrastructure is better. They've already redeveloped much of Anfield. They've already got the training facility. So you wouldn't need to invest in in that no, area? They're in a better position on and off the pitch at the moment, you could say. And arguably, you know, absolutely 100%. I think we've said that for the last four or five years. But you can't, I, 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 it, it's not arrogance, this. You cannot mm -hmm. deny the scale of Manchester yeah, United. Yeah, yeah. You just can't. Um, it's, it is... A, it's just different um, and Liverpool is the most successful club when it comes to European Cups, United the most successful club when it comes to Champions Leagues but I think when you look at commercial revenues Manchester United are I think just a, as an asset just a, a better buy. If Manchester United, I think the owner will look at the fact if Manchester United get it right on and off the pitch and Liverpool get it right on and off the pitch Manchester United will be bigger. Mm -hmm. And just to close off We've spoken about where Manchester United can change hands in terms of ownership. How do they now plot their attack moving forward, given the termination of contract with Cristiano Ronaldo? And then where do you perceive he goes next? Obviously, another record in the bag. Yeah. Do you think this World Cup can influence teams, top teams, reconsidering how they feel about him? Or do you think he might need to settle? Well, I, I, I was I was in a studio the other day. Where I was told that he'd been offered two hundred and fifty million pounds net in, I think Sky broke it as well in Saudi Arabia, right, yeah. for a couple of years. Each year that is, by the way. Um, I would think looking at it, Cristiano Ronaldo is probably going to be looking for a top club on a four or five month contract where he can go in and do a brilliant cameo role at the very elite. Of European football that's what I would think his priority would be to stay in the Champions League to stay at the very top to prove that what happened at Manchester United isn't right and I think he's got four or five great months in him somewhere where he'll go in score 15 20 goals in that period everybody in Manchester was saying why didn't we keep him <laughs> you know people in the Premier League will as well but he's got that in him I would say that would be his priority and I think he'll get to the end of the season and then think right what's my next two years what's the end of my career look like what does the sort of last project in my, my what does the last football project look like for me is it in the US is it in the Middle East is it somewhere else in Europe that he's not played before so for me I think that Cristiano will have a priority, I think, to stay in the Champions League and to stay at an elite football club because that's where he believes he should be. And that's where he should be. Mm. That's where he should be. I, you know, I hope he does really well wherever he goes. It didn't work out in Manchester in the end, but it was the right thing for the club to do to sort of, if you like, break ties. And it was the right thing for Cristiano to do. And in January, Manchester United have got to try and use that money 
that I think they will have saved. It looks like they've come to a commercial deal. Yeah. And it, they'll have saved a lot of money, and hopefully that can Around go into... Around £16 million. Pounds. Yeah, so hopefully that money can go into something short-term that will get them to the end of the season. Or if they can get a longer-term position on someone that's available, which isn't always easy in January, then, yeah, go for that. That would be the preference. But they spent over £250 million, didn't they, last summer? I don't think the money's there. So I think they're looking at that short-term fix, really, at this moment in time.